for the participant, can you please mute your uh, mics just to avoid any noise? <laughs> Okay, again, Assalamu Alaikum and uh, good afternoon, good morning. Uh, so today uh, we have, um, we'll start the program, the fourth day program. And today we have uh, Dr. Sayyidatul Noor Ahmed. Uh, Dr. Sayyidatul, she is a senior lecturer at University of Uttara Malaysia. Uh, and she got she, uh, her PhD from University of Science Malaysia on PhD, the topic on sustainability accounting and reporting. So Dr. Sayyidatul today will be speaking on sustainability accounting. So the floor is yours, Dr. Sayyidatul. Okay, thank you, Dr. Assam. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh and a very good um, afternoon because now in Malaysia it's 4, 7 p.m. in the evening. Huh? Um, okay, so I hope that you all can sh see my slide. Yes, yes. All right. So I will start. Um, okay, so the full slide itself. All right, so my topic would be sustainability accounting. I'm uh, Dr. Sai Datul Nuru Hidayah Janat Dunak Imitin Nur Ahmad, and uh, you can call me Dr. Sai. I'm from Tengkuin Tan Safina School of Accountancy, Nusti Utara Malaysia. It's in Kedah. Yeah? And I got my PhD in sustainability accounting, uh, focusing on creative accounting, but in terms of sustainability, how companies are being creative uh, in terms of uh, their reporting, as well as what they actually do in practice. So I'm focusing on that. So today um, on sustainability accounting, it's actually a really hot topic um, in terms of accounting research, as we are talking uh, right now, but um, today we are just going to look at the introductions of sustainability accounting, how sustainability is in connection with accounting. If we talk about engineering, then we know 
we have to you have to do uh, a better products in terms of um, you know lessening the environmental impacts of your products and in, in terms of your products but how accounting has anything to do with sustainability well it's a lot there's a lot of uh, connection between sustainability and accounting and we will talk about that today and I hope uh, if there's any questions, you can actually unmute your mic and then just ask me and then I'll see. All right. Okay. So first of all, this is the outline of what we're going to cover today. So we're going to talk about sustainability, social and environmental issues. I'm sure for the past four days or for the past three days, you've got, you have, um, you know, being exposed to all these uh, issues. I'm just going to, you know, go through it once again. Uh, so that we know why actually accounting for sustainability is so, so important. Because if there's no issues, there's no need for you to be writing about it, right? So we're going to look at the issues first, and then we will look at what is meant by sustainability accounting and reporting. What is it actually? Why, why there's a need for sustainability reporting? because we know that companies are already doing annual reports. They report practically everything there. So why there's a need for reporting on social and environmental issues. So we're going to talk about that as well. And we're also going to uh, look at the trends in reporting in terms of um, who's reporting on sustainability in terms of which companies in the world that is currently reporting on sustainability and a little bit on research and sustainability accounting and the education parts of it and then we're going to wrap up with uh, you know your questions or yeah at the end of the session that is the outline all right so when we talk about sustainability you cannot escape from having this definition to be given to you. All right, what is meant by sustainability? It's meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And this is the report of the World Commission on Environment and Development, United Nations, uh, a general assembly in December 1987. Now, what you see about sustainability there is actually a bit vague. Um, if I might say that meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generation, what do you mean by future generations, right? Uh, how many generations are we talking about? And meeting your own needs, how do we know what we're doing now is not going to uh, jeopardize their opportunities to meet their own needs? So as much as it is vague, but this definition is actually the most cited definition across you know, sustainability research area. You talk about accounting and whatnot. When you talk about sustainability, people will quote this. But it actually needs much more of interpretations of how do you mean by meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of generation. OK, so that is the, the main definition. But if you think about it deeply, we are now actually producing sustainability reports that is actually about unsustainability. So we are not sustainable yet. We are just reporting on how we are being unsustainable. That is from Rob Gray, um, one of the uh, big thinkers in the sustainability accounting arena. So sustainability report is actually unsustainable. An unsustainability report, report about you being unsustainable because we're not sustainable right uh, yet, okay? So it's okay, there's a lot of things uh, that have to be think about the meaning of sustainability. Um, there's a lot of nuance in that, but most important is that we currently are not sustainable. What uh, businesses are doing right now, it's not sustainable. And uh, whether you like it or not, we have seen the effects across countries in the world, climate change and all that. So it's happening. It's whether or not we do something about it. Okay, so in the research community, especially, we have to do something about it anyway. All right, so um, let's talk about sustainability and organizations. If you see uh, meeting the needs of present uh, community without compromising the, the needs of the next generation, then we talk about, oh, it's individual. 
uh, at the individual level? What can we do? But actually, the most impactful uh, people or the most impactful um, business entity, the most impactful uh, activities are coming from organizations and business activities, not from individuals on its own, but collectively when, you know, you've got companies as big as a country running uh, resources. So that is where the impacts mostly coming from. So that is why we emphasize that all businesses should be much more accountable of what they are doing with the business. Um, so there's a, a connection between what businesses do and why do they need to be responsible about it? Because what they do is actually impacting a lot of things, environment, society, and not just their business. Whatever that they are doing, everything around follows. Everything around is impacted. So that is why we, when we talk about sustainability in accounting, especially we focus on organizations and we focus on businesses, for-profit organizations. So the role of the organization in terms of sustainability, uh, as we all know, businesses are there because they wanted to make profit and increase shareholder value, shareholder value. But what about other things? What about their responsibilities to their employees? to their customers, suppliers, community that they're impacted. Why is that they're impacted the community? Because they operate inside the community. So whatever that they're doing, if you have a factory, for example, you have a factory and then you, um, you dump your chemical waste in the nearby river. So it's not only your organization's you know, just trying to find an easy way to, to dump your chemical waste. But what you're doing is actually impacting all the th all the people that is living, you know, around that river, you know, and then we, we have this Sungai Kim Kim in Malaysia, we have Sungai Kim Kim cases where river is polluted with chemical waste and all that. That is how everything is interconnected between businesses and community and the environment, everything is interconnected. And when there's a connection of that, something has to be done from the organization part of it. You, they have to be much more responsible, but how they are going to be responsible, right? And stewardship of the earth, of course, uh, whatever that resources that is being used by the businesses, it's not infinite, it's finite, you know, it is finite. So. How are you going to be responsible for it? You put a monetary value on it. Is it that is the value? So yeah, not necessarily, right? And then the future prospect of the company. Yes, businesses uh, that do not want it to think about sustainability might think that uh, as long as their profit is okay, as long as the operations is okay, they'll be good. They don't have to care about environment and society. But nowadays, when you talk about businesses, they can't run from it because sustainability is actually part of their survival. Okay, I'm doing on um, palm oil companies, actually. Uh, when, my, when I did my PhD, it's focusing on palm oil company and palm oil industry because that is uh, a sensitive, one of the sensitive industries in Malaysia. So I wanted to see how they change in terms of reporting as well as their practices. So I did not only look at the reports, but I look at their practices. I go and uh, interview from CEOs until uh, people on the ground, you know, uh, that spraying, spraying the estates and all that. So that is uh, my, my scope. And you know what? For a palm oil company, for they to for them to actually sell their oil, palm oil, to other countries. Yeah, because in Malaysia, we produce a lot of thousands of tons of, of palm oil. So we export a lot of it. But when you talk about exporting palm oil to other countries, especially Europe, you also have to have not only a certain quality of the oil, but also you have to meet their criteria of sustainability, for example, 
the production of the oil should not exceed the maximum level of emission, you know, during the production. So what is the GHG level of that oil, of that particular oil? So they have to meet that criteria in order to access the market, especially the European market, especially the biofuel market. They really need for you to meet the sustainability criteria, for example, emission. So in order for you to do that, or in order for you to reduce your emission, you have to start from the planting procedure, the planting, when, when you, you start to like plant the, the palm oil, you have to think about what are the fertilizers that to be used so that it doesn't emit so much carbon. Yeah, you have to start from square one in order to have that criteria. So that, because if you don't do that, you cannot enter the market. You cannot access the market, especially the European markets. And there will be a lot of issues with that. So sustainability is not just about being sustainable, being ethical, being responsible. It is being, uh, you know, it is, it is uh, important for you to survive, for the businesses to actually survive in this current world. All right, because we all, we, we know that um, in terms of finance, there's a lot of social uh, aware, socially aware investors. So that is why we have FTSE for good um, indexes, you know. A lot of investors are now looking at sustainability features of the company, not only whether or not they can give you good dividends, good profit uh, growth, but are you really sustainable in terms of not only sustaining the profit, but actually, is that what you're doing um, that will not harm the environment and the society that you're impacted? So a lot of investors are looking at that, uh, particularly now, right? And then also in terms of sustainability, you all uh, companies also have legal risk. They have risk in terms of sustainability, but legal is much more uh, is, is much bigger than any other uh, risk because that is not only talking about when you are being fined because you are not sustainable. We can see um, how Kit Kat was, uh, how Nike, Nike was, um, was attacked uh, because of sustainability issues. How Kit Kat was attacked because of sustainability issues. Uh, Nutella, um, and we have local company, IOI, uh, palm oil, uh, I'm talking about palm oil, IOI, is also attacked. And this raised not only legal sanctions, but also reputations that will impact them. So companies have to look at sustainability much more, uh, much more important than any other things right now. And then also competitive position when they are, when they are you know, trying to compete with others. They are not only competing who about who can make better products at a better price, but you also now have to compete about who can make a good product, but also a sustainable or a green product. So that is the level of competition now. So that is why sustainability is the buzzword, because it's not only about, like I said, it's not just about responsibility, it's about survival. And of course, uh, in terms of stakeholder society and the government attitudes, especially the non-governmental um, organization, the NGOs, they are very vocal right now. So one attack from any international NGOs could really wipe away your shareholders. So basically, there's a lot of things going on uh, between organizations and sustainability issues. So that is why accounting have to play a role in that. Okay, um, we might think when we think about so social environmental uh, developments, we think about sustainability. I we think we thought that oh, this is maybe just about ten years ago, maybe they started ten years ago. But no, it has started about I think forty years ago, because it started with uh, in nineteen sixties and nineteen seventies with the birth of the green movement, and then in the nineteen eighties to mid nineteen nineties. It's the social environmental failures, corporate and institutional responses and sustainable development emphasis. Now here in the 1990s, where the companies started to report or started to look at their social impacts, their employee impact, the, the impact of the businesses on their employees, especially human rights. Yeah? And then they look at, um, then they look at environment. 
Okay, so it's social first and then environment. But when practices, when businesses actually started to look at sustainability, started to look at social and environmental issues, the research picks up from 1990s. So the research follows practices actually. And then on, from the millennium until today, globalization and recognition of the fatality of environmental and social issues has spurred a lot of interest from a lot of um, uh, a lot of uh, areas to do on sustainability because we can see it nowadays, climate change and all that. So it is very in your face. So you cannot you cannot like deny it. So the the matter of, uh, of fact is what we we are doing about it. All right. So um, that is the development. So it has been forever. So we look at what are the significant environmental issues that is normally there. Yeah, we're normally, um, you know, a lot of countries is experiencing it. First of all, it's air pollution to production of greenhouse gases, chemicals and other potentially hazardous substances. Um, if you talk about um, palm oil, for example, there's a lot of GHG coming out from the production of palm oil. So one of the ways of them to be much more sustainable is to actually reduce that by um, installing biogas, uh, biogas power plants and all that. So that they reduce the methane gas. They actually emit methane gas. So methane is actually very harmful, greenhouse gas. And then also there's a threat to biodiversity and land degradation through habitat destruction and deforestation. Again, if you're talking about palm oil, it's all in there. They have to clean a huge plot of lands to actually grow one type of trees. So you, you all know that when you know a huge plot of plant of plot of land is being grown with only one type, a single type of tree, then the the diversity is not there anymore. The biodiversity is not there anymore. It's it's, it's wiped off. And it happens to thousands and hundreds and thousands of plot of land across the world. We're not talking in Malaysia, we're talking about Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, and a lot of other places with palm oil. So the biodiversity and land degradation is real. It's really real. All right. And then the, a lot of habitat as well being um, destructed in the process of growing palm oil, for example. Water pollution, which could lead to depletion of marine uh, marine resources and access to fresh water. I've said it before. Um, factories dumping chemical waste in, in, in the river is actually not a, a new issue. It's actually an issue for a lot of a long time ago. But it you know it, it comes out a bit more now because we have the information and you have the you know we have the know uh, everyone know about it uh, know about about their about the company's uh, misbehavior of that so for example as we came came that I said just now and production of excessive waste in, with inadequate disposal system uh, not only in the river but in the landfill as well noise pollution and environmental issues it's actually interrelated and could cause climate change. And we are already seeing climate change as we're, as we're talking right now. Um, this is in terms of infographic climate change. We have like water shortage, longer winters, um, new terrain, and this everything will have impacts on the industry, whether you believe it or not, because you started it, the business started it, and then things will get back to them as well. All right. So we move into another another uh, dimension of sustainability. We are talking about environmental and and there's two dimensions that is very important: sustainability, the environmental and the social issues. So we've talked about the environmental issues. Now we are talking about social issues. So the first one is human rights, including indigenous and minority rights. Now, since I'm doing on palm oil, I'm again uh, going to say it about what is the case with palm oil. In terms of human rights, a lot, a lot of, a lot of um, indigenous and minority rights are being, um, you know, when they do, when when they are, uh, where they, when they're trying to actually clear the land, 
before they clear the land, they have to earn, they have to own the land. For example, uh, they wanted to have a, a, a new plot of land. They wanted to develop a new plot of land, for example, Indonesia. And there lives a minority, a minority people, indigenous people in that plot of land. So they wanted to develop that into a palm oil. So can you imagine how many families will lose their land? How many families will have to lose their customary rights to the land? So there's a lot of land disputes, especially in palm oil estates when they wanted to do a new development. Sometimes they use um, extortion. If you don't want to give us your land, we're going to do something to you. So you don't, you don't have any choice because there are big corporations normally. And then um, sometimes you just asked the head of village to give you the land. Not everyone will agree because that is a customary land. So when it is a customary land, you have to ask everyone. Everyone should agree with the new, uh, with the new development program. But if, just, if you just ask the, the head of village, then he agrees you know, with you know, monetary rewards uh, normally, then there's also rights that is being, um, you know, it's being, what do you call it? You know, you, you took the rights of, of the people there, okay? So human rights is actually a big issue, um, especially if you're talking about palm oil and other industries as well. Labor rights, uh, when you talk about sweatshops, um, labor rights is very, very, very crucial. Health and safety, product responsibility, community well-being and the society as a whole. So these are all the significant social issues, which is all these issues, all the environmental and social issues, you can see that will be different from companies to companies. Even though they're sitting on the same plot of land, their social issues or their environmental issues would be different depending on their nature of the business. If you're talking about palm oil, so these are the things. If you're talking about oil and gas, other issues, but still it touches on environment and society. It's just a different aspects. Okay, so uh, what did international uh, organization and local responses do about this? So we've got World Earth Summit, Kyoto Protocol, Paris, um, Paris Agreement, UN Global Compact, Sustainable Development Goals. I think this is 2017 SDG goals, right? All the 17 goals. And then from Malaysian context, because I'm from Malaysia, uh, Malaysia has made a CSR report mandatory for main and ace market as a listing requirement for companies in the main and ace market uh, to have a corporate sustainability report in 2007. But what happened is just that because the, um, the guideline of CSR uh, report being made by the Bursa Malaysia, it's not really thorough. So what company did was they mostly report on philanthropic activities, what they donate, for example. But in terms of sustainability, philanthropy is just one part, a very, very small part of it. What we wanted to know is actually what are your impacts? What are your main core impacts from your main core activities and how are you going to do about it? So that is the main concern in sustainability report not about just about your donation. Yes, donation, of course, could actually bring up, um, you know, community benefit, gives benefit to the community, ben give benefits to, to students through scholarship and all that, but that, that, that is not your main, that is not your main impact normally. So when they see that, when they saw that trend just on philanthropic activities, and it is very, very glossy reports, you know, nothing much more substantial, nothing that we wanted to know, okay? Not the level that we wanted to know. So they launched a different framework, sustainability framework in October 2015. Now this time, it is much more comprehensive. So you have to report on everything and especially on your core activities and core impact and how are you going to um, manage your sustainability impacts. So that is the development. And let's look at what is actually sustainability and accounting connections. All right, so if you guys have any idea about accounting, I don't know your, your background. Uh, so basically, I, I just 
you know, uh, assume that you, you know accounting is a basic thing. So normally when we see accounting, we see financial accounting, right? Financial accounting is just, you have to record all your transactions, all your business transactions. At the end of the day, you come up with a report and uh, the report will say, how are, you go how are you doing so far financially for the year? Are you doing good? Do you have any growth? Um, how is that you're doing this year as compared to last year? So that is growth. We, we look at growth profits in terms of um, growth, yeah? So that is accounting. It, it tells you how wealthy you are today uh, from your businesses, you know, shareholders, of, of course, from your businesses for this year. That is mainly it, it, financial accounting. So whatever the decision is being made in the company is to actually increase profit and increase shareholders' wealth. And so everything that you make in terms of decisions, uh, how much to produce, where to supply, where, where to get supplies and all that, where to market your product, everything is in cost and benefit kind of justifications. But is it enough? Is it enough? Financial accounting, is it enough? So if you're looking at what I've been telling you just now, it's not, it's not enough. It's not enough just to look at the cost and benefit because it goes way more than that. Your impacts is go, way, goes way more than the profit and loss of your account. So accounting, next accounting is all about accountability. But we can argue accountability to whom? Traditionally, yes, accountability to your shareholders. So that is why all your transactions, all your profits, you have to disclose to them in annual reports. But is that all? Is that all? Okay, in terms of Benston, from Benston 1982, the only mandatory form of corporate accountability necessary in the free market system that we're in now is financial accountability. This is the positive of accountability views or the efficient market hypothesis where you are only liable to make, um, you know, to, 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 to explain yourself in terms of financially, you know, to explain yourself to the financial investor. That is the only responsibility that you have, okay? Financial accountability. So whatever the money go in, money go out, that is the only responsibility that you have. That is for from Benston, which is not, not um, it's not wrong, it's right. Because yeah, people give you money, investors give you money, invest in your company. They won't, they won't wanna know where those money goes and come from and, and you know, how are you managing it? Of course, yes, you have the accountability financially. But Shocker and Sati, 1974, said that any social institutions and business is no exception. Business is also part of social institutions that operates via social contract, express or implied wherever its survival and growth are based on the delivery of socially desirable and to society in general and the distribution of economic, social or political benefits to group from which it derives its power, social contract theory. So this is from social contract theory. So basically, Shoka and Sati is saying that when you are a social institution and businesses is also a social institution because you cannot stand alone and you operate in a social contract where you are given the uh, permission to operate by the society because society thinks that what you're operating will benefit them as well. Okay, so you have in that, you are in that social contract. So you are liable to be accountable to the society that gives you that power. Or else, you know, if, if uh, you are in the society, you are in business because society wants you, you to be in the business. They want something, they want the benefit out of you. So you have to be accountable to them as well not only to the people that are giving you money. So that is the short social contract theory um, 
So the, the second uh, viewpoint. So the contract actually involves rights and responsibility, which requires communication between parties in order to exchange or to discharge accountability. Now, when there's a social contract and when there's an accountability, then when you are accountable of something, you have to explain yourself. And how are you going to explain yourself without reporting? So that is where corporate reporting comes from because companies have to explain themselves to the people that are uh, that they have to be accountable for their shareholders the society the ngos you know overall so that is where corporate reporting comes in and and um in terms of sustainability itself in terms of accounting we know that financial accounting is not enough because you also have other impacts the companies operating have other impacts so that is why there's a need for sustainability reporting sustainability accounting and reporting so that is why that is where corporate reporting comes from actually okay so uh, we continue with what is the meaning of actually sustainability accounting and reporting now Accounting and reporting in terms of sustainability is the process of measuring and communicating sustainability performance and of being accountable to internal and external stakeholders for an organization's social, environmental and economic performance. This is from GRI um, and also has internal and external aspects involving management and reporting. Sustainability accounting is actually information management and accounting method that creates sustainability information. So accounting and reporting is two different things, but it is interrelated. You have to do the accounting part first, and then you will have to, you know, you can, can do the reporting because reporting without accounting will be like, where do, you, where do you get the data from? So you actually have to have that data that you have to do in sustainability accounting. For example, if the normal accounting, you have to, uh, trace all your transactions from day one you operate until the end of your of your year end okay so you have to trace everything your sales and all that and then you make it into a report now that tracing is actually accounting and then you report that it becomes annual report okay that is the same for sustainability accounting and reporting you have to account for sustainable impact first for sustainability impact first in terms of social environmental impacts and then you can report about it that is it. And, uh, but these components are often disconnected in practice. Why? Because, of course, there's measurement issues. How do you measure impacts? Air pollution, water pollution, you know, how much water you're, you're, you're using. Not all companies have the apparatus, have the tools to actually measure all this, all this thing, all these externalities all the water that is being used, the, the air that is being polluted and all that. So not all companies have these. So without these, without the tools, without the right tools to measure, you cannot account uh, for it really well. And if you cannot account for it, you cannot report it. Sometimes you don't have that accounting, but you report. It can happen. Okay, so we call that creative accounting. It's a sustainability uh, reporting. We call it creative accounting. You are trying to be creative. If you create something, you say, oh, um, you say something, or oh, we, we actually managed to reduce our electrical consumption by this far. You can just name, you can just like put in the report. Because auditing for sustainability reporting is not a common practice yet. So you can actually say whatever you want. Businesses can actually just say. So that is why there's like often disconnected between what you actually account and what is being reported in the reporting itself. Okay. So this is uh, what sustainability accounting is all about. It's about reporting, yeah. But this is the end of it. This is the Z. You ha also have sustainability management. And you have sustainability scorecards as well. Uh, as much as you wanted to have a performance scorecard, okay, you also have sustainability scorecard. How much 
is pollution that you can actually reduce this year, for example. So you have to have the scorecards as well. And sustainability governance and all of this is actually sustainability accounting in order for you to get the data, in order for you to say that you actually uh, reduce your electrical consumption, for example, you also have to have all of this in order for you to claim that. All right, and we're talking about sustainability accounting like it is important, but why is it actually important? Well, a lot of countries now make it compulsory. Malaysia, for example, makes it compulsory, like I said just now, for listed companies. And um, it is making, it is made as a mandatory reporting under the SEC. You know, and the and the you know a lot of countries with different you know different requirements, but it become a mandatory reporting already. But we also have voluntary external reportings, for example, GRI, DGSI, and all that. Corporate sustainability report. This is voluntary, and investors often uh, really appreciate if you have voluntary sustainability reporting because it shows that you are committed to being sustainable in terms of your businesses. And in terms of internal management, environmental and social costs, if I can add here, environmental and social costs are actually real. You know, when you have like climate change, for example, we talk again about palm oil. When you have a climate change, it will actually impact your plants, right? Uh, because they do not water, they do not water their plants they actually uh, hope for the rainwater to actually water their plants. So imagine if there's a drop. Imagine if there's no rain for a few months, then their produce will be impacted. Their production will be impacted. So it is real. So when it is real, you have to actually manage it. How do you want it to make sure that you have um, adequate amount of nutrients in your land? For example, how do you have, want to make sure that you have your plants will have a, a, a good moisture level, for example. So that is something that you also have to manage in terms of internal uh, management. And that could actually come from sustainability accounting procedures because you also have your scorecards. You have your KPIs in terms of sustainability. And that actually takes care of uh, your environmental uh, condition as well. All right, and then there's also potential revenue and source of differentiation. When you actually care about environment, for example, or you actually care about your employees, you can actually uh, produce much more revenue, right? It makes sense, right? Good environment, your plants, uh, your trees are actually growing at a, at a good rate. You've got good production uh, volume, better revenue. So it's a win-win situation. Okay, all right, so that is why it is very, very important. So there's actually differences and similarities. I think I've covered it a bit about similarities and differences between financial accounting and sustainability accounting function. Now, in terms of similarities, it covers, yes, it is uh, both of the reports or both of the accounting forms covers whole organization. Sustainability reporting, also you have to cover the whole organization. And financial reporting, also you have to cover the whole organization. You can't do it just one department, right? And then the accountability of reporting is also similar. Uh, financial reporting, you also have to answer to not only your shareholders, but also your customers, your employees and all that. So it's similar with sustainability. And information for management, also similar. Quality issue in terms of accuracy, consistency, comprehensiveness, reliability, relevance, validity, auditability. These are all the quality issues with financial accounting, but sustainability accounting and reporting also have these similar issues. You know, have quality issues. But it's just that for, sustainable, for financial accounting, we have auditors that will audit because auditors for financial accounting is a must, it's a mandatory. But for sustainability accounting, it is not a mandatory requirement. So who are going to make sure that the sustainability report that businesses are producing is of good quality? Now, that is the problem. When you don't uh, make auditing of the report mandatory, okay? 
But the issue is the same. Accuracy, is it accurate? Both of the reports. Uh, if you thought that financial accounting is very accurate, I tell you, you're wrong because accounting is very, very subjective. We've got different methods for recording different things. So you can actually choose which are the methods that shows the level of profit that you want. So the longest joke in the accounting uh, area as an accountant would be, you know, a person coming into the, uh, you know, an accountant goes into the boss office and, and asks, well, uh, if the boss asks the accountant, one plus one is how much? Then accountant asks uh, the boss back, how much do you want me to write it? So that is accounting. You know, there's a lot of um, ways or means that you can actually manage what figures you wanted to put in the report. But it is being audited, so it is somewhat being controlled. But in terms of sustainability reporting, no, when it is not reported, when it is not um, audited, then it is very, very risky for people to do, to be a bit creative about it, to show something that is not there to make sure to, to make their appearance better than it is actually is. So that's a, that's a risk. But in terms of differences between sustainability and accounting, in terms of purposes. So for financial accounting, for example, it is much more on financial stability of the company, but sustainability looks at much more than that. It looks like it looks more on impacts of your activities. Type of reports, financial accounting have formatted um, report or types of reports. Uh, we have um, statement of comprehensive income. We have a statement of profit and loss, balance sheet and all that. That is already, uh, you know, standardized. But in terms of sustainability, there's no standardized report. We have a standard which is GRI, but it is not mandatory and you can actually uh, just choose which of the items in sustainable in the GRI that actually applies to your organization. So each organization will have a different set of items in sustainability reporting. So it's not the same. For financial accounting, it will be the same. You will have profit and loss, you will have balance sheet, or you have all that. But in sustainability, it will be different because your issues is different, your impact is different. So there's no standardized report. In terms of legal requirements, also the same. Uh, also, it is different. Well, uh, Financial reporting is uh, required for in Malaysia. It is required by the Companies Act. But for sustainability reporting, it's only required for listed companies. But we also have a lot of unlisted companies, private companies that is not in the listings. So they do not have to produce any sustainability reports. So it's different between annual reports in the, in the financial accounting and also uh, sustainability accounting. Uh, users other than the management, the sustainability reporting, uh, normally external users will use it much more than the internal. All right, but financial reporting will be used by, by a lot of people, uh, internal and external as well. Measurement and methodology, like I said just now, how do you measure uh, pollution level? So that is uh, depending on the organization's ability to actually measure, to, to have the tools to measure pollution, to have the tools to measure water consumption, electricity consumption, and, and all that. And not all organizations have that. But to measure financial performance, all organizations have that ability. So financial performance is much easier to measure than sustainability performance. And data management and system. So this is a very different, uh, those two accountings, even though it is called still called accounting, but they use different set of data and data management and systems. So accounting have to have like maybe uh, SQL, UBS or whatnot, but sustainability have to have other systems for them to capture the information on sustainability impacts of the business. Okay, so that is the similarities and differences. Now we look at the reporting trend of a worldwide businesses in terms of sustainability reporting. This is actually one of the um, one of the most 
updated one because the KPMG one is actually done way in 2017. So now it's already 2020. Now this report is coming from uh, 2019. So this is much more latest. So this is a disclosure of 20 environmental and social practices by 6,000 companies across North America, Europe and Asia Pacific. Now leading the highest disclosure now leading is Japan. Number two is United States and then Taiwan and then UK and then China. And the rest is Asia Pacific, lah. Singapore, Indonesia, Russia, Poland, Pakistan. But you can see that actually the bigger the, 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 bigger the company, the more, um, the more emphasis they put on sustainability. Why? They have a lot of risk because when you are big, you are most probably a multinational and you probably uh, being operating in more than one countries. So your risk is huge if you have sustainability issues. So that is why they put more emphasis. Uh, so large companies normally report. And if you can see the trend, average disclosure by sectors, sectors that are much more um, environmentally sensitive that is disclosing much more information on sustainability reporting. So leading is energy and then utilities and then materials and then the rest follows. So normally it is the environmentally sensitive sectors that is the most comprehensive discloses. Okay, why? Because they have a bigger risk. They have a bigger risk of having sustainability issues. So that is why they, they, they disclose more, you know, to give the confidence that we're, we're, we're probably a very uh, environmentally <laughs> environmentally sensitive companies, but we're doing okay. We're doing a lot of things. We're doing a lot of good things. So that is why they produce much more sustainability reporting in terms of to boost reputations. Lah. Okay. And uh, in terms of disclosure trend, uh, disclosure across a wide spectrum of sustainability issues is on the rise. Until 2019, everyone is uh, increasingly reporting on sustainability items, it means. All right, and these uh, drivers are shifting sustainability reporting from a largely voluntary practices to one increasingly expected and in some cases required of companies. So it's not only before this it is voluntary, sustainability reporting is actually mostly voluntary, but now it's moving towards everyone must do it already. You can't escape from it. And then sustainability disclosure is also on the rise, but more disclosure does not necessarily translate into changing practice. For example, what the example that they gave here is that even though there's much more disclosure on this uh, on GHG emission over the five over the past five years, but if they look at they look at the collective GHG emission by these companies that is being disclosed. Uh, the GHG emission is actually on the rise. So the pollution is on the rise, but also the disclosure is also on the rise. So disclosure does not, uh, it's not a good indicator to say that you are, we are now in a better, less polluted world. It is not an indication, all right? Because even though you disclose a lot more, but pollution is also on the rise. So it does. It is not. Um, you know, yeah. It it does not. It does not follow like that. And also, there's also regulatory development in Europe. Uh, will continue to influence the sustainability disclosure practice of companies in other jurisdictions. Of course, uh, in the Asia Pacific, normally we, we, uh, you know, we take the practices from the Western countries, of course. But companies should keep an increasingly close eye on development in Asia as well. So Asia is actually um, you know, on the rise on sustainability reporting as compared to their peers in the Western countries. Now companies can expect increased pressure to include information related to gender equality, such as board diversity and the gender pay gap. So this is a social issues that is on the rise. So you have to now companies did not disclose it yet, the gender pay gap. You know, how much is your female employee being paid uh, as compared to the male employee? So companies are not uh, disclosing about it a lot, but they will be pressured to, be, to disclose about this because this is a hot topic and a hot issue 
uh, the gender pay gap. All right, so in sustainability reporting, we have a lot of types of reporting. We have the general sustainability reporting, but we also have climate reporting or carbon reporting, and we also have integrated reporting. Okay, for example, uh, this is climate change and carbon reporting. And these are the methods that could be used by businesses to actually reduce the carbon. So now we're talking about carbon credit and all that. So people are really uh, put emphasize, putting emphasis on carbon. You have to reduce your carbon emission. So yeah, these are the ways uh, you know that you have to that the businesses can do to reduce their carbon emission. And another form of reporting for sustainability reporting is actually integrated reporting. This is another form of report. Okay, this is not the same sustainability report that I'm referring to. This is a holistic and integrated representation of the company's performance in terms of both its finance and its sustainability. Uh, and it enables stakeholders to assess the ability of an organization to create and sustain value over the short, medium and long term. And integrations means performance should follow strategy and target sets. And normally integrated reporting is ideally in a 20 page report. Uh, and it is a single document reporting the company's financial, environmental, social and governance. So everything, financial, environmental, social and governance into one single report. And explanation of the relationship between financial and non-financial performance. For example, how do you um, how do you use your resources? So you have to actually show the connection between how do you use your resources and how do you do you make sure that you use it sustainably, and how do you you know make sure that uh, out of that you come up with a good value for your business? So you have to show it in one report. And not, not just combining various reports. Integrated reporting is a bit uh, different. And ideally, it is a 20-page report. If, if you wanted to know sustainability reporting plus annual reports, normally we can go up to 200 pages. So integrated reporting is only a 20-page report. So it's very concentrated. It is very comprehensive, but it's simplified. People can see where's your value creation activities, and how do you use your resources in connection and you put it in one report. And uh, integrated reporting framework, however, is still in development and International Integrated uh, Reporting Committee established is actually in August 2010, 10 years ago, and this goes further than the GRI. Okay, because integrated reporting follows uh, the information needs of investors what investors really wanted to know. So they what they, they put that in that um, you know in that criteria. Broader consequence of decision making. So when you make decision according to integrated report, you are actually looking at not only the economic aspects, but you also look at the social governance aspect, the environmental aspects as well, and how do you create value out of it. So yeah, it's a broader consequence of decision making. So we talk about um, yes, we've talked about the practice, now we talk about a bit on the research itself. Now, research on sustainability accounting and accountability um, have a certain journals that is focusing on this matter. So we have auditing issues in sustainability accounting, auditing issues. We have extent and quality of the reporting itself. People look at that. People look at um, how do you report over the years, the changes. How do you report over the years and also the changes in your practices? So that is one of the things that uh, people research on sustainability accounting and accountability. So these are the journals, uh, Triple AJ Accounting Forum. These are the journals that is uh, mostly is in Q1 that focuses on sustainability accounting. Not only focuses, they actually receive a lot of sustainability accounting uh, papers. So European Accounting Review, Public Accounting Review, Qualitative Research in Accounting and Management. This is um, focusing on qualitative research in, in accounting, especially in sustainability accounting. And there's also a specific special or specific journals that focus on sustainability accounting or reporting or CSR, which is Business Strategy and Environment, Business and Society, Business and Society Review and all of that. So um, 
these journals actually have a specific focus. These journals, it's much more general. Now this, you have to look at what is the special issues and then you, you, you uh, have to you know, uh, look at how your research match with the special issue that they're, that they're, um, that they're offering. Okay, so in terms of that is in terms of uh, research. Now in terms of educations, um, back then 10 years ago when I did my accounting degree, uh, sustainability accounting and accountability is not uh, being thought so much in the university as far as I can remember. I think only one small, very, very small topic in the accounting theory. That is 10 years ago when I did my master's um, four years ago. Um, sustainability accounting and reporting is actually one whole subject. But now it is already one whole course. You can, you can actually have a master degree in sustainability accounting or environmental accounting or something like a sustainability degree. You know, the whole course is about sustainability accounting or, or environmental accounting and all that. So you see that how, how it, how it um, transformed from just being a, a small topic during our degree year and then becoming a subject and then becoming a course in itself. So why do we need to study CSR or sustainability? Now, education is the main or important or critical for promoting sustainable development and improving the capacity of the people to address environment and development issues. If you don't educate people about sustainability issues, about sustainability impacts, then we can't do anything about it, yeah? Yeah, the, 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 you know, whatever the catastrophes that is happening right now, it will only get worse because people don't know about it. So that is why it is very important. And UN, United Nations has named 2005 and 2014, I think we could actually stretch that a bit until now, as the decade of education for sustainable development. So this is, we're sitting in the decade that we have to educate our generations our researchers uh, about sustainable development. Okay, so I've come to the end of my presentation about sustainability accounting. Uh, I know that it's a lot to take <laughs> to take because it's a big, big topic in sustainability accounting or reporting itself. Uh, so I've talked about sustainability accounting. I've talked about climate change a bit, integrated reporting, research and teaching. All right, so um, I think I could actually end my session here and would open for any questions from the floor please hey dr sayedatul uh, thank you so much for the interesting uh, talk uh, i think uh, uh, we will go for the next uh, session for the okay. next topic. all right because we a bit uh, uh, we have some delay okay all right no so, problem I think we, we, we can have a Q&A at the end of the session. Okay, no problem. All right, thank you very much, everyone. Bye. Assalamualaikum. So, uh, Dr. Mahmoud, are you there? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, Dr. Osam, and thank you, uh, Dr. Sayyidatul Noor. I think a great presentation. Yep. Yes, yeah, so the next session will be on uh, social sustainability. And our speaker will be Dr. Mahmoud al Borai. He is a senior advisor at the Dubai government and also the Global Goodwill Ambassador and uh, the SDGs leader. Uh, Dr. Mahmoud, he got his PhD uh, from France, right? The Grenoble Economy yes, Management. Yeah. yeah. And he got his master's from University of Oxford. Master of Sustainability Studies, and he got another master's on CITES from the London School of Economics and Political Science. Um, so the CV is too long; we can't uh, <laughs> we can't we can't present it all. So, uh, so Dr. Mahmoud, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. And, well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wissam, and thank you, everyone. I, well, I promise it's going to be light, so we have more questions uh, with uh, Dr. Uh, Noor as well. 
So uh, I'll make it more of a conversational, more of uh, uh, so as Dr. Wassam said, I've been in this sustainability field for a long time and uh, started the United Nations, the global compact in the Middle East uh, with uh, almost 150 business uh, companies joining this initiative. Uh, so uh, can you see my screen? screen? Yes, yes, doctor. Okay, good. So uh, social sustainability and post-COVID-19. There are a lot of questions about COVID-19 and the impact of COVID-19. And the most important thing is that a lot of people actually now care about sustainability and talk about sustainability and they want to see it. Not only government as we used to hear before, but also businesses. Uh, although sustainability is economic, social, and environmental, there has been so much focus on economic and environmental with less focus on the social side. And this is our opportunity to bring social to uh, uh, equal footing in terms of importance. So uh, when the lockdown took place for a few months, a lot of uh, roads, a lot of uh, offices, malls were closed. This lockdown actually has reminded us of something called the social animal as a human being. So it awakened the social element within us uh, as a human being. Uh, there is a, a quote by Peter Singer. He says, human beings are social animals. We were social before we were human. And a lot of research actually focusing on the social side sees the social sustainability is the most sustainable or the uh, uh, most uh, uh, effective when it comes to uh, well-being and happiness. So, uh, Professor, this... could you show us by full screen? Sorry? Could you show by full screen? Okay, I will, I will see. Show. What about now? Good. Yeah, good. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, the social distancing within COVID-19 actually has rem reminds us that of the importance of having the social life and the connectivity and the people element. Uh, there was an article on uh, COVID-19 and its impact on the globe. So there are a lot of talk about uh, different trends and more of uh, you uh, more of a Chinese centric globe and so on. But the most interesting stuff is that it reminds us or the trend that we will have is less focus on a profitability of business and more focus on the sustainability side. And this is something we will uh, love to see it taking momentum and getting to the next uh, level. So definitely the uh, COVID-19 will accelerate adoption of sustainability. Uh, we always have to remind us that we have a globe that has a lot of people who are suffering. So we have 836 million people living in poverty. And this is not only in Africa, but in so many other parts of uh, the world. We have 828 million people living in slums, living in the same amount, same number, living in an affordable housing. So there's so many elements of social sustainability. Uh, 65.3 million have been forced from home. We call them refugees. So there, are, there are so many social challenges that require from us actually to take the social sustainability more seriously. Adding to that the disasters and during the last 30 years, we have more disasters. The frequency has doubled. The economic loss coming from disasters have Rebuilt to $1.2 trillion. In the pictures you see, this is recent uh, bombing in Beirut or whatever. I don't want to call it bombing, maybe it's a different thing. But the, the, the disaster that took place in Beirut. And this requires from us actually bringing the social side and community side and bringing them along with a public private uh, partnership to reduce uh, risk and disaster and build resilient communities and resilient uh, societies. Uh, we see also a trend, and with COVID-19, this trend is widening, which is inequality. So, yes, there was a, uh, an income inequality. It worsened before uh, COVID-19, but it's even becoming worse and worse post-COVID-19. And this is something that has to be taken into account. A lot of people are losing jobs. A lot of businesses are closing or shutting down. And it's actually bringing the gap even wider and wider, and it requires from us urgent actions uh, uh, to be taken. Uh, 
cities will have 100 million in new poor post uh, COVID-19. And I, I, the reason I wanted to bring COVID-19 because we see COVID-19, although it's a threat, but it's an opportunity, opportunity to have to accelerate the adoption of sustainability, to accelerate the partnerships, SDG number 17, public, uh, people, public private uh, partnership. Uh, we have a lot of challenges that requires from us actually taking action. So social sustainability is really a key important element in driving sustainability, in driving competitiveness, in driving even recovery post COVID-19. What is it? So many definitions, but the most important thing it's it's the uh, structure, processes, systems in place to support creating healthy and livable communities. It's about having uh, uh, equitable, diverse, connected, and democratic uh, uh, life and provide a good quality of life. This is one definition so if you look focus about health and livability equi equitability diversity democracy and good quality of life they're all elements of a good social sustainability other definition it's about understanding what is it that people need and this is key if you want to do a system this system should be people's friendly the system should work for people so it's about designing of the social infrastructure in a way that supports social and cultural life, social amenities, systems for citizen engagement, and space for people and places to evolve. So uh, this is uh, another definition of that, but how to put it in application and in practice, and this is something really important, how to uh, apply it. So a lot of countries actually have made, uh, like Australia and New Zealand have made social sustainability as applied urban policy concept by focusing on having the right social mix, livability, affordability, community services, and street uh, uh, life. Okay, so the most important thing is to have the right setting and the right context for human interaction, communication, and, and cultural development. Uh, there's so many areas of social sustainability. It's about social equity, livability, health equity, community development, social capital support, human rights, placemaking, social responsibility, social justice, and so on. So there's several elements to social sustainability. If we go back to the platform and to the framework, sustainable development goals, the 17 of them that were adopted in September 2015, we can divide them into economic sustainability pillars, social sustainability pillars, and also environmental sustainability pillars. So this is the one that shows how they're divided. So you see more pillars and more blocks towards society. And this is why Ban Ki-moon said when the ex-secretary general that this is as people's SDG. So focusing on uh, people, no poverty, no hunger, good education, good health, um, gender equality, zero hunger, peace, all these are great and, and needed elements. But along with economy and environment, we cannot have this system functioning if it's not coupled and it's not, uh, and synergy is not built with economy and uh, environment. So it's a total system solution and we need to think of it as a system. Connected elements, they all impact each other. We've done our competitiveness model here in Dubai, uh, and this is for city of Dubai and how we build a competitive uh, city and competitive market, real estate market. And we found that quality of life, which resembles the social mainly and environment are very important or is very important pillar for building a competitive uh, and resilient uh, uh, city and uh, resilient uh, real estate market. And for that, along with government and economic and market resilience, we require delivery platforms to support the delivery of the competitiveness, which is stakeholder engagement. And this is a core element in driving sustainability, stakeholder, market governance, transparency, innovation and adaptation. And by here, we refer to radical technology and radical changes and radical innovation to drive sustainability uh, and competitiveness. Healthy cities 
uh, is part of uh, it when we talk about social. Yes, it can have also social and environmental element. But building public health through, through urban planning is something actually can very important in COVID-19 uh, period. And by having healthy city, the aim is to create a health supportive environment and achieve good quality of life and basic sanitation and hygiene needs and to supply access to healthcare. And this is really important. And we've seen how much uh, health and public health has been overemphasized in COVID-19. A lot of research have uh, concluded that having green building increased health outcomes. Other research also from Harvard School showed that countries with higher levels of uh, pollution actually had higher death rates. So focusing on the uh, building healthy cities is also should be a policy uh, uh, direction and a strategy uh, by cities and government. And this is an example of how we build walkable cities and uh, we have issues with this in the region. So this is how I used to look in 2016 and how I look right now. So I found it difficult to have, uh, to exercise, to have a healthy cities. It's not uh, friendly for walking, it's not friendly for uh, exercising. So this also requires from us also an urban intervention in a lot of countries. Uh, we found that people look beyond buildings, people look beyond the city physical infrastructure, they look to the neighborhood, they look to the city amenities, physical and non-physical. So providing a total solution is, is important and looking at, this, at the city as a total system is important. Government is also important for sustainability, for social sustainability especially. And their role should be beyond facilitating. They should be actually leading and should be actually funding social change and social innovation and then also uh, social sustainability. Peace is important for sustainability and social sustainability. Building uh, a secure, safe city, safe country is, is also part of uh, building a social sustainable uh, city, resilient. Is, uh, resilience is important also because it helps our system to be re to be renewed, to be transformative. Uh, and we've seen this also in COVID-19, how we can have, how the social community solution can really uh, support and help with the building sustainable uh, communities and how to react and how to uh, reduce risk and make communities more uh, resilient. Um, the role of business is also important when we talk about uh, social sustainability. I remember that we've been saying here in Dubai and a lot of countries, what's good for business is good for the city or good for Dubai. And this is something we need to rethink about it. Actually, what's good for people is good for the city. Um, if we look at business role in communities, there are a lot of evidences that shows that uh, businesses have been always focused on the financial side and economic side. So if you look at the S&P 500 firms, they use 54% of their profits to buy back their stocks and 37 to pay dividends, but less has been left for society and community. So we see that businesses, the way that they're the way that they're running now is not actually catering for communities and society. Actually, it's society and countries that have to bail out businesses most of the time. And from taxation, have, you have to pay for them to survive. Uh, so a lot of research has been done in this field, but we see that businesses actually are responsible for degradation of environment and depletion of natural resource, but at the same time, responsible for a lot of remaining poverty worldwide. So we would love to see that COVID-19 or post-COVID-19 is a great stage for us to push businesses to become more responsible and more attached to the societies rather than focusing on CSR and not harming the environment and tactical, uh, we need more of uh, strategic movements. Uh, so, uh, Firms thrive at the expense of community, right? And even with CSR, as I said, the focus is still on not harming the public interest rather than doing what's good for society. 
We've seen CSV creating shared value. This is a more advanced concept uh, going from focusing on giving back to community to CSR, but also the most advanced one is the shared value, which is finding business opportunities into social problems, although it has a lot of criticism, but it's a good uh, way forward, I think, by combining the social and business side and looking at it at opportunities that create both social and economic value for uh, firms. Uh, and there's so many levels of that. Uh, UN Global Compact, and sorry, I'm, I'm going fast. I have several slides to, to cover, but then we'll have more questions hopefully at the end. I used to lead the United Nations Global Compact in the Middle East, and this is a great uh, platform. Uh, I mean, GRI is a great, but also you and Global Compact, you have to have a reporting on what you as a business, uh, when you join this initiative, what you do for human rights, for labor rights, uh, for environment, and also uh, for anti-corruption. 10 principles linked to SDGs, you have to report on them on a yearly basis. So, and we managed to get actually 150 businesses to join this initiative in uh, Dubai. And we think that uh, this is a great platform for companies to join and become more uh, sustainable, especially the first two actually focus directly onto the social side, human rights and labor rights. Uh, and the question we always have to ask, can profit and sustainability coexist? Can we have a new business model, a high, uh, kind of a hybrid business model for firms, hybrid firms, where they can achieve profitability, but at the same time achieve sustainability. But the question is always, which one is the priority? Is it the business? It is the sustainability. Uh, and this is again, uh, something that needs to be discussed in the business community. Um, another concept that's related to social sustainability is what uh, Henry Leverer so talked about right to the city. So cities, cities should be places that encourage freedom of expression, play, creativity. Uh, but currently what we see is that cities are being are shaped to reflect the interest of businesses rather than the interest of uh, people. So we see more private space than public spaces. And nowadays with COVID-19, we've seen the importance of investing in public spaces. And we've seen actually a lot of cities now are uh, taking back streets from cars and giving it to people and investing more into social capital and social infrastructure. Uh, Jim Jacobs said a good city should have a good mix of businesses and residential. It should be for people and businesses. It should be livable. It should be uh, innovative. It should uh, provide sense of uh, community. And this is the urban uh, social sustainability side. Why cities fail, why nations fail? A lot of cities fail and nations fail because they become more of exclusive, more of extractive rather than inclusive. So if you want to be uh, in, uh, sustainable, we need to be inclusive, city for all. And this is a good book that uh, covers history of cities that failed over the last five centuries. And the basic reason behind failure was we build institutions that exclusive for a few uh, that covers few kind of people that does not cover all people. So we need to have more inclusive institutions that covers that uh, it's people centered and build happy nations. Uh, so public space is important. The uh, city is what Plato said is what it is because our citizens are what they are. So it's about citizens, it's about people. And this is what Shakespeare said, what is the city, but the people. So this is a social element. Um, there is also a kind of overlap between social sustainability and happy city. And we've seen a lot of uh, examples of indices done on happy cities. Uh, we always look at uh, Nordic uh, countries as the happiest countries. Uh, and this has to do with the history. This has to do with the uh, the context itself. I don't want to go into details, but if you go deeply into these nations, you see also missing elements. So if you go to a lot of these streets and cities, you don't see livability. You don't need, you see activity in a lot of their 
uh, street. So a livable city is a happy uh, city. And happiness actually, uh, as Aristotle said, it's the meaning and it's the purpose of life. Um, okay, so how we build our cities to become more of people centered. This is something really important. And this is an example from Amsterdam 50 years ago, how the city used to be built for people. And now we see it done for, sorry, used to be for cars. And now it's it's mainly about people, it's bikeable, it's uh, walkable. So there has been a lot of investment actually in the social side rather than investing in the economic side. And that actually eventually will impact economics of the city. And this is the streets. We've seen hundreds of kilos and millions of actually, and hundreds of kilometers of streets have been regained by people. And now it became more of a places for biking, places for walking. The question is what we're missing. We're still missing better social life in cities. Um, uh, if you look at uh, this uh, graphs, it talks about if we build more social cities, it will become more trusty cities, and at the end, it will become a happier city. So there is a link and there is a correlation between social life and happier life. And actually, research shows that social life is the most sustainable sources of happiness and well-being. Um, and coming across a stranger make us happier, although this may now being questions in COVID-19 period, but it's, it's, it's a really uh, important uh, concept and important uh, uh, area to cover. A lot of people, if you go to a happy city and search it in so many engines, you see people uh, always link happiness with the places, with identity, with culture, with public spaces. And this is really uh, important for us to focus on how we build housing for people rather than for profits. And the issue of gated communities is another issue. A lot of cities have been actually focusing on building segregation within cities, building a quality of life segregated for rich communities. Social sustainability requires inclusivity, it requires building cities for all, building cities for people rather than for cars. Because if we plan cities for people and places, we will get people and places. And if we plan it for cars and traffic, we will get car and uh, traffic. We need to invest in green infrastructure and in green public spaces and affordability because this brings uh, happiness. We don't wanna end up cities for rich, cities that are segregated, cities that have high income inequality gap. This all needed to be thought about in policy making and also in the uh, private sector as well. Happiness requires inclusiveness. So there is a city in India that I visited called Amaravati. It's in their construction. They have a very interesting platform actually how they look at happiness and social sustainability. They uh, have looked at it this way, a combination of governance, Okay, so it's about having the right governance, citizen engagement all the way, and also built environment and quality of life when it comes to the urban planning of city, natural and environment, economy, you need to have job creation, you need to have sustainable economy, you need to invest also in the culture and community and identity of the place, and finally, physical and mental well-being. And I find this platform in the urban side is very interesting because it covers the different economic, social, environmental aspects, and it's linked to uh, happiness and sustainability. Uh, just a couple of few slides. Uh, this is how Dubai used to look like, and I'm giving you the example of Dubai 1973. This is how the city used to look like, a fishing village with little investment in infrastructure, but then making the city tax-free, making the city attractive for people. This is Dubai airport, how it used to look like. And this guy with a, a t-shirt, white t-shirt used to come 7.30 a.m., open the airport, close it at 2 p.m. But then with the government believing in sustainability and mainly economic side, this is how the, the in Dubai International Airport looks like. Emirates Airlines has started with two leased planes and now 200 planes traveling to 200 destination. There's so much has been done on the economic side. Uh, this is how it used to look like. 
But over time, the city grow and grow for the interest of businesses mainly. Recently, we launched the Happy City and Smart City, focusing on people's interests and how we make the city uh, for people. So you see a lot of uh, structure and a lot of investment in infrastructure. Um, this is an example of a community in Dubai uh, focusing on building social life, but you don't see people actually enjoying social life. So um, this should be a lot of focus on how to make the city livable and community more integrated uh, rather than segregated. So rather than sprawling, we need to invest within the city and within the city center. So uh, when we look at the city, it's about people, hopes, aspirations, and pride. And this is the social side. So how we link a city with personality, how we make our cities uh, more people oriented. Uh, this is the most important uh, thing. And this is about creating a good global citizen. And this is a call for all of us as sustainability ambassadors to take uh, sustainability seriously, work with different stakeholders. It's about community, it's about uh, stakeholder engagement, it's about right governance, it's about transparency. And it's about also looking beyond the borders. Uh, we as youth have so much power, we need to implement this power, we need to advance the social venture and social innovation and, and solve social problems. Uh, there are so many social problems and we've seen the numbers and statistics and one hand cannot do it, two hands are needed, government alone cannot do it, it needs the private and people. And this is the total solution that uh, uh, we talked about. So uh, this is my uh, last slide. And I think it's good to bring also Dr. Saida Tunur as well for the questions, if that's okay, Dr. Rawasan. Yes, yes, Doctor. Thank you so much Thank for you. the interesting talk and uh, the topic which is uh, really interesting because mainly people talk about economy and if they are a bit more concerned, they will talk about environment but the social dimension, it's always like will be less discussed and uh, considered. Um, so Dr. Sayedatul, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm here, I'm here. Okay. Uh, so let me see the uh, questions. Uh, okay. I seen some questions earlier. Um, somebody commented on the COVID nineteen and the impacts. Uh, okay. I think for those who have questions, you can uh, just unmute your mic. Uh, yeah, that can be possible. Yeah. Uh, there is one question. What about Africa figures are not displayed? I'm not sure. Maybe this is for Dr. Mahmoud. African figures? Well, actually, this is more of a global uh, uh, numbers taken okay. from the United Nations sources. So there are actually a lot of uh, slums and poverty that we talked about. Maybe half of it is in Africa and Asia or even most of it in Africa and Asia. So uh, Africa is the virgin continent uh, and it uh, has a lot of potential. But before talking about social sustainability, I think the focus and priority is about economic sustainability, creating job, creating a affordable life. And actually the urban growth in the coming decades will be in Africa. So actually it's more urgent to have action in Africa and solve all the challenges there. Okay, I think this question to Dr. Sayedatul, uh, how can we be trained uh, in sustainability accounting? Do you recommend any course? Yeah, I, I recommend that you, if you have a financial accounting degree, then you can actually go into a postgrad for sustainability accounting. 
but if you don't have the degree, I mean the basic for from from the degree level for financial accounting, uh, that would be quite a challenge, but it still can be done. So you can start with masters, and then uh, you know you can actually know your focus after that because the the area is huge. You can look at from a lot of aspects, from auditing, from reporting, from the practices itself, um, from guidelines. You know, people people look at the guidelines and what are the improvement that to be made to, be, to the guideline itself. Yes, it is also one of the research uh, uh, research aspects. So, in order for you to be specialized or be expert in one area in sustainability accounting, you also have to have its basics first. So I recommend a master degree, something like that, on sustainability accounting and reporting, and then you follow through with uh, a further, uh, maybe doctorate degree about it. Yeah, I think that is uh, the, the standard way to go about it. Yeah. Mm -mm. Okay, uh, so Dr. Sayed okay. Tola, this is, this is from uh, a yeah. question from me. Uh, to what extent uh, yeah. do you see the practice of sustainability accounting like uh, from your uh, experience here in Malaysia? Extent? Extent of reporting? Yeah, I mean, to, so to what, you're talking about... what extent they are ex uh, practicing? I mean, is it like really being practiced? or it just like maybe some companies, big companies, and it's just because of the Yeah, normally, yeah, yeah, uh, you're right. And so normally, like I've said just now, a lot of big companies are doing it because they have to have it uh, in terms of uh, securities um, commission requirement, listing requirements. So all the big companies, all these multi-billionaires companies are usually doing it because they have a lot of resources. They can hire people to write about it. They can have the tools that I mentioned, the tools to measure uh, their impacts. So they have that capabilities. So for small companies, I rarely see it, especially the small and medium enterprise. Uh, so they are currently much more focusing on profit, not on sustainability aspects. They couldn't afford to think about sustainability aspect because they are actually surviving financially. So that is what happening in Malaysia, lah, like what, what I can see. So even if the big companies, they are doing it, but we cannot really attest 100% that everything that they reported is actually the real numbers, uh, the real impacts that they're reporting. So because it is on, on audited, all right? And then uh, the extent of reporting is okay. I think um, we're, Malaysia is doing okay in terms of who, in terms in terms of people, in terms of companies that needs to have that report, uh, the large companies, the multinational, the, the, the listed companies. But in terms of other businesses, no, I don't see it. I don't really see it now. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so there is one question, I think, for Dr. Mahmoud. Uh, UAE countries, uh, less plantation. Means mm -hmm. There is there are less plantation. So how you work for it? Well, actually, um, we, we have uh, the government has been working a lot on and making the Dubai greener. And there is a lot of actually uh, also private uh, sector work by we have master developers, big government developers who are also investing in uh, green areas and green parks. Uh, so uh, but the nature of Dubai and the nature of the city makes it actually very expensive to have the plantation and actually it reflects all the, uh, and this is something more of a real estate oriented if I want to talk about it. We have a lot of uh, projects here in Dubai. People pay a lot of service charge and a lot of the service charge because of the uh, uh, plantation, it's very expensive. The water is expensive. So, um, but there are a lot of actually uh, measures have been taken by the government and private sector to, to make Dubai a greener city. If you came to Dubai 10 years ago and compared to today, Dubai is much more greener than before. Uh, so there is one more question. What do you think uh, the main reasons for the failure in recreating our old social ties in the new city planning? Well, part of it is actually we said the cities now are being built uh, in favor of businesses, less focus about uh, people. 
Uh, so uh, a lot of focus is in the economic side, how we become an economic hub, less focus on quality of life, less focus on public spaces. Uh, so we mainly, if you go to big uh, cities like in New York and business cities, you have so much focus on businesses and commercial spaces and less about the uh, entertainment and green area and public spaces. Uh, so uh, it's about system failure, I think, in putting people at the center. Uh, our cities now uh, became more of uh, the city center becomes a commercial hub. And then we have a sprawling people living uh, in a suburb far from cities. And actually, there are a lot of people who support this now. They say, if we, be, if we live in a dense area and people living in this dense area, this is bad for public health. And we've seen it in COVID-19. And this is why the city center should be for working and people should be living outside the city. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, theories in this, but it's, it's failure, definitely it's planning failure. Uh, uh, and it's a question of uh, so much focus on businesses rather than focusing on people's needs and requirements. Okay, uh, somebody is asking what kind of profession are there when it comes to implementation of social business, uh, the social business group uh, reality? Sorry, the question again, what are the profession? What kind of professions are there when it comes to implementation of social business group to reality or making it a reality? I mean, you need everyone to be involved. You need the government, you need the private sector. And profession, I think it can be the urban planner, architects, but also the businesses, the uh, environmental uh, people as well. Uh, you need to have uh, the engineers, you need to have the accountant, you need to have everyone is involved in, in, in this business. But also we need to have the NGOs. There are a lot of NGOs and grassroots of institutions who represent people. And I think uh, they are the ones who don't talk business. They talk about quality of life and so on. So I think NGOs are the ones that you see most of the time advocating for social life and, pub and public life. Um, yes. Uh, so there is one more question. How does urbanism affect uh, social sustainability in a big city? Sorry, uh, how does? Urbanism affect yes. social sustainability in a big city. Well, in big cities usually, uh, and especially when it becomes a global cities, uh, a lot of people migrate to these cities. You have a lot of urban poverty within cities more than having uh, poverty in rural areas. So a lot of people come to the city to improve their economics. And actually this uh, you see in a lot of, especially in Africa, you see slums within cities, people who cannot afford living in the city. So the, the city actually, you have the affordability challenges and poverty challenges are the most important challenges of urbanization. And you have also the, uh, the pressure on infrastructure, on roads and transport. So the city becomes congested, the city, uh, the pollution and so on. So there's so many challenges uh, for the urbanization. And also the disconnection of social ties. A lot of people go to the city, they're in rural areas, we're connected, we're the same family, same tribe, close people, neighbors. When you go to the city, it becomes more of isolated uh, life. As an individual, how can we involve in making a progress to SDGs? To me or to Dr. Saida? Oh, so as an individual, um, I've been talking more about uh, businesses have to be responsible of what they are doing. But I've not uh, talked about how we as individuals could actually make sure. the world a better place. But actually, everything starts with us. I still remember one of my professors in the UK when I studied in, the, in Bristol University. Uh, he is a professor in sustainability. He taught me sustainability accounting. And he actually uh, did not drive any car to the university campuses. So he just uh, took public transport from his house 
to the university and he is a professor. He's not a normal lecturer like me. And I think that he is actually doing what he preach. You're not just preaching about sustainability. You're not just listening or learning about it or reading about it. You actually do it in your, in your daily life. Reduce your plastic consumptions, for example. Reduce electricity consumptions. Uh, reduce anything that could emit emission uh, uh, you know greenhouse gases uh, in terms of my, my professor uh, public transport in the uk is using um, sustainable energy so they're not using fuel they're using um, electricity so that is much more cleaner for the environment so he knows that so he straight away do not buy any car just use public transport i think that is uh, something that i can't see in malaysia for example uh, i can't really see professors riding buses from university to the house and to other places that is very very rare and i think uh, we as an individual have a lot to do our part um, in everyday life uh, water environment we try to uh, use plastic as less as possible, use glasses, uh, you know, reduce your waste and all that and, and just consume foods that is just, you know, enough for you to feel full, not like, um, you know, having waste because waste is actually you are using resources, okay? And then resources, like I said just now, it's finite. It's not infinite, it's finite. And it will, it will, uh, it will finish one day. So we have to be, aware of our consumptions and that is i think the best way to actually uh, do something about the unsustainable uh, world that we live in now yeah yeah i mean to add to what you said doctor um, we always yeah. uh, teach our uh, people how to fish right we say mm. teach them how to fish rather than giving them the fish but we don't teach them how to fish responsibly and how to consume responsibly so it's about actually responsible yeah. consumption and responsibility. Uh, I have a small kid uh, and they teach her in the school. She's five, six years about sustainability. And she came to me and said, Daddy, I know what sustainability. It's reuse, recycle, uh, it's reduce. So if we teach our, even the young generation, I find them more uh, sensitive to environment and the more actually uh, attached to that. So we need to definitely take this as an opportunity. Uh, also linking the environment and health. There's so much research on the impact of environment on people's health, and we always have to advocate for that. So as an individual, actually, it's not enough for us to uh, pierce the darkness. We need to light up our candles. And every one of us as an ambassador, we should be ambassadors in our homes, in our offices, in our communities and actually uh, leading, uh, working within NGOs and uh, grassroots and NGOs is really important. It's about awareness, creating awareness. It's about also uh, leading by example. We need to be also an example for responsible consumption and also sustainability. Yeah, exactly. So uh, there is one more question. What is the difference between making place and public space? I mean, there is a de definitely uh, public spacing and place making. I mean, place making is about identity of the place. And when we make a place for people, part of it is actually investing in public spaces and build more of public spaces where people can communicate, uh, where people socialize, uh, where people go for entertainment. So it's, it becomes part of the city identity and part of place making. So it, they're, they're related concepts. Uh, is blue economy is helpful for sustainability? Blue economy? Blue economy. Do you mean the gig economy? I'm not sure what they mean by... I think they mean like innovation. Is that related to innovation and blue ocean strategies blue and stuff? Yes. Yeah, I mean, uh, innovation actually is one of the pillar of SDGs and it's uh, radical innovation is needed. You need technology to drive sustainability, to drive environmental sustainability, but also the technology. Now we see the human side of technology in driving social sustainability. So definitely innovation and technology and uh, out of the box ideas are important to speed up the sustainability and sustainable movement.
So keeping in, in view the human nature, what three qualities must exist to achieve social and economic sustainability? <laughs> three, uh, and a human being, you mean as an individual, right? Yeah. Uh, there is in, uh, I don't know, I don't want to talk about religion, but uh, apart from being a Muslim, yeah. in Islam, we have the uh, sustainability actually from the Prophet time. Uh, even you are saying, ولو كنت على نهر جاري. This means like save water, even if you have a running water, if you have a running river. Yeah. So uh, being a good religious uh, person, and I, I'm sure other religions as well have same uh, uh, actually principles is that sustainability is part of our religion and we have to actually uh, uh, take it seriously. Uh, uh, being also uh, social and friendly is something, a quality I see that's needed nowadays and uh, uh, people need to invest in becoming more people oriented, more social, working in teams, working in, uh, within community and group. And the last important one, and I think, is the communication. Being able to be, to communicate to people, to be convincing is really important quality that has to be there in a uh, 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 person who is leading innovative and uh, sustainability project. Okay, so I think this is the last question. How can countries work towards including persons with disability in the clean cities uh, sustainability? This is really a great question. Uh, and we've seen a lot, of, there is a, an overlap between the urban planning side and building cities. Uh, we call them here in Dubai, people of determination. We, we actually stopped using uh, disability. We think that they are people of determination. Uh, so how we build the city to be friendly for them, how to build our buildings to be friendly for them, how to build our public uh, transport, public amenities, is, is, this is really important. I've seen actually several cities who started including uh, uh, building city, not only for uh, people of determination, but also old people. How we in make city for old and for kids, this all requires from us actually looking at the physical and non-physical policies and strategies of the cities and make them you know, uh, adapting to uh, people. Uh, so this is last, Dr. Sayyidatul. How can we deal with the issue where the authorities are advocating for sustainability mainly on papers, signing of treaties and relationship with NGOs without actual implementation? Yeah, that is why the uh, role of us being a citizen, a good citizen should uh, vote for a good leader. Now, when we talk about sustainability uh, treaties between countries, this is not our level already. This is the level of uh, people in the higher hierarchy, the leaders, the, the, the country leaders and all that. So our responsibility is actually to choose a leader that actually care, that don't really just uh, sign things and not uh, look at whether being, things are being implemented or not. Okay, so in Malaysia, for example, before this, we have a really good environmental uh, minister and that, that actually goes to the ground and look at uh, garbage that is being sent from Australia to Malaysia uh, illegally. She actually, look, she actually go, and, and sh go and check it herself. It means that that is uh, the indicator that that person or that minister actually cares. But unfortunately, because a lot of politicking happening in the country, and you know that Malaysia is actually, you know, changing government and all that, um, I don't see it now. I don't see it as um, as good as it was before with that minister. So I'm not going to name names, but that is actually the indicator or the kind of leader that we should uh, put forward in the government. Someone that really care about the environment, someone that really care about sustainability, then uh, those things could be implemented in practice. We can't do anything about that. This is really in the leader's um, authority. Yeah. So okay. our okay. responsibility is to, to actually choose a good leader. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I think we conclude. Yeah, that's it. it.
thank you, you so much, uh, Dr. Mahmoud. Thank you so much, Dr. Sayyidatul. And thank you, uh, thank you for so much, all the participants. Yeah, you are welcome. And we'll thank continue you. tomorrow. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Mahmoud. Thank you, you are leading by example, Dr. Wissam. I've uh, been following you, you're leading sustainability, and we're so proud to work with you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, me too. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for having us, yeah. Yeah, thank you, you're welcome. So we'll continue tomorrow, right. the last day for the program. Thank you so much, we'll see you tomorrow. Bye. All right, all uh, the best, Dr. bye. Assalamu alaikum. Dr. Achib. Sorry? Yes. Uh, okay. So maybe you want to conclude something on today's session? Uh, okay, very interesting today. Uh, but I think uh, no more comment because everything so clear and so comprehensive and easy to follow for uh, all participants, I think. But uh, something uh, very interesting, We this is something awareness for us about early warning about how nation fell. So we should address to answer for every country. I think we have 80 countries here. So how to making a grid strategy, making leveling, making staging, and something action plan, and making good indicator. So everybody can be good uh, grid ambassador for global leader. How to create something actionable and easy to follow from everybody, every nation and become a, something global partnership between among us uh, for better future, right? Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. And tomorrow, Achim. maybe it's, uh, how about the topic? Yeah, tomorrow we will be having uh, one session on leadership and two sessions oh, on- Oh, very good. Time. Yeah, very good. I think this is very relevant for all us and become a main topic for, for all of you as, as Great ambassador, eh? Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Achib. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. We'll see you. We'll see you tomorrow. Have a good day. Bye.